Malaysia's power struggle. Mahathir Mohamad's sudden resignation has thrown the country into uncertainty. But what's motivated this just two years after a surprise comeback? And what does it tell us about politics in Malaysia? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad has long been seen as a master of Malaysian politics. His shock resignation on Monday has triggered speculation over what he may be planning. He's been resisting pressure to set a deadline to hand over power to his named successor, Anwar Ibrahim. They put aside their decades-long rivalry in 2018, and that partnership brought Mahathir back into power. Under the deal, Mahathir promised to hand over the top job to Anwar Ibrahim. Now, the ruling government has collapsed and political parties are rushing to forge alliances to form a new one. So, will Mahathir come back to power through a different political partnership? That's what we're going to be discussing shortly. But first, Al Jazeera's Florence Louis reports from Kuala Lumpur. Mahathir Mohamad, in his capacity as the country's interim prime minister, met with party leaders from across the political divide on Tuesday. Now, reports say he is proposing to lead a unity government, one that would see politicians from rival parties working together to form the next government. But that idea has been rejected by the main opposition party, AMNO. Now, AMNO was dominant in Malaysian politics for more than 60 years until it was voted out in a general election two years ago. Now, AMNO, at a press conference together with several other opposition parties, have said if Mahathir can't even lead a coalition of four parties, what more a coalition that consists of 12 parties? So they're calling for parliament to be dissolved and they want fresh elections to be held. But another possible scenario that could happen is the formation of a new coalition. Now, political horse trading and negotiations are still taking place, and it's too early to say which parties could end up having enough numbers to form the next government. But if this outcome sees the return of opposition politicians to government, then there could be more political upheaval ahead for Malaysia. Now, civil society organizations, even politicians, have called on Malaysians to reject such a government, saying it would be undemocratic and a betrayal of voters' trust. Florence Louis for Inside Story, Al Jazeera. Let's try to get to the bottom of what's really going on in Malaysia right now with our guests on Inside Story today from Kuala Lumpur. We're joined by Bridget Welsh, political analyst and senior research associate at the Centre for East Asia Democratic Studies at uh, the National Taiwan University. In Doha, Anto Mosin is assistant professor at Northwestern University, focusing on links between society, energy and environment in Southeast Asia and also in Kuala Lumpur. Ibrahim Sufyan, who is a pollster and executive director of the Mercada Center for Opinion Research. Welcome to you all. Bridget, let's start with you. Uh, he's managed to resign the premiership and the leadership and yet uh, of his own party and yet has somehow managed to keep both jobs. Why did Mahathir resign? Does he actually intend to stand down or, or is all this a, a political ploy? Well, I think he resigned because his government collapsed and there was a, a power grab within his, the coalition, which he rejected some of the co coalition partners that, the, that some of his defectors and power grab were actually joining forces with. He didn't want to work with Omno. Um, but he came back um, because he still holds the, uh, the position in terms of being the dominant political position in terms of the parties um, and is seen as a stabilizing figure uh, during this transition period. Anto, um, what's your take on what's really going on in Malaysian politics right now? Was, was Mahathir under pressure to go? Uh, and, and if so, who, who was applying that pressure? Well, from a few sources that I read uh, inside Malaysia, um, uh, it wasn't really uh, a pressure to go necessarily, uh, but he was upset uh, by a member of his own party, um, his home affairs minister, uh, Muhyiddin Yassin, uh, who uh, colluded with Azmin Ali, his uh, econ uh, ministers, uh, from another party, uh, the party of Armar Ibrahim, who seemed to want to form a new government. Um, and, and he didn't want to work with AMNO, uh, just like uh, it was said by another, the other guests. Uh, 
and he resigned in protest, basically. Ibrahim, what happens next? Does the king call a snap election, or will Mahathir attempt to form another stronger coalition, one to his own design this time? To what extent has, has, has all of this done him a political favour? Um, I think, you know, what's going on right now is the king is interviewing uh, every single member of parliament trying to determine which particular leader commands majority support. I think going by that direction, the inclination is not to have a general or a snap election at this point in time. Uh, I think an election will only be called in if uh, the government couldn't function, if the prime minister couldn't command a majority for a considerable period of time. I think what we will end up seeing in the next few days is uh, Dr. Mahathir trying to form a new coalition comprising his own party, uh, the previous coalition that supported him, maybe parts of that coalition, as well as other parties that were, you know, independent or, uh, you know, even some uh, opposition members. I can't rule out the fact that uh, some opposition members of parliament might split uh, their party and join him instead. And that might provide him with the kind of majority he needs to A, form government, B, address some of the issues that plague the old ruling coalition. And, and Ibrahim, where does that leave Anwar Ibrahim? Uh, and, and what's happened to the agreement uh, that there was between Mahathir and uh, Anwar Ibrahim uh, that, that Mahathir would step aside and allow him to become prime minister? Well, I think the current view right now is that that agreement is no longer valid, partly because the government has collapsed and that new coalitions are going to be formed. And along with it, maybe new deals that will need to be cut with the different political parties. Well, having said that, Anwar Ibrahim's political career is far from over. Uh, he certainly commands a sizable uh, number of members of parliament within his party, even though uh, several members have left. Uh, and so I think he still remains a force in mission politics. However, uh, Mr. Ibrahim's uh, entrance as uh, prime minister may be delayed because, you know, Dr. Mahathir essentially calls the shots right now. Bridget, as we said at the beginning of the programme, Mahathir Mohamed has long been seen as a master of Malaysian politics. Um, would he be have been aware of the discussions that were being held by those within his own party with, with members of the opposition who were implicated in the, the 1MDB uh, scam, scandal, which was, which was what he was reportedly so upset about. I think it was very clear that the, the, in the talk in the town was of these particular elite wrangling and backdoor government deals for months now. So he could not have not been aware of it. Uh, but whether or not that power grab that failed on the weekend broke down maybe from too much demands or, or not clear clarity on who the partners were or the degree of upset in the process, um, it, it, I think still remains unknown. I think what to step back from this process to build on what Ibrahim Sufyan was speaking just now, Malaysia is going through, is a coalition government, uh, and it is now facing for the first time in its history having to work with new coalitions at, that have broken down um, in terms of the alliances uh, and come together. There are eight different political parties, all with vested political interests and 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 wanting to hold on to positions. The horse jockeying is intense, and many of them do not hold very strong positions, but they have enough that they can be a kingmaker or at least decide uh, the future of the government because of the fragmentation of the system. So right now, a lot of the jock today has been spent intensely involving this horse jockeying and re elite wrangling. Um, at the same time, those that are, don't seem to be as, as strong are already choosing to call for elections. So the opposition, Amno and Pass, has mentioned, have been mentioned, they've choosing to actually push for solution, which is also the call that's coming from civil society. Uh, Anto, um, one um, prominent opposition leader has called what's happened a, a, a coup d'etat. Uh, I, I just want to get over this, this, this scepticism I feel about what's actually gone on, the motivation for what, what's actually happened here. Um, uh, is, is Mahathir blameless in, in what's happened, or is this uh, political manipulation uh, by a, a master? a political master? Well, I don't think there's any single master here, but there's definitely uh, a lot of uh, political jockeying, uh, like Bridget says uh, earlier. Uh, 
uh, uh, the attempt, it seems, to uh, grab power again by um, Amno, who uh, used to be part of the ruling coalition for 60 years until 2018 when they voted out, uh, appears to be uh, uh, one of the explanations that are you know, swirling around in this um, uh, behind what's happening right now. But uh, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the king, uh, Yang Dipertuan Agong, Sultan Abdullah, will be a key figure in shaping what's going to happen next. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, the alliance between Mahathir's party and, and Anwar Ibrahim's party, indeed their alliance, was, was pretty unlikely from the beginning, wasn't it? To what extent uh, was this bound to happen at some point, given the long-standing tensions within uh, the, the, the governing coalition? Well, I think the signs were always there that there is some reluctance in order to, uh, you know, for, for, for a long-standing deal uh, to take place, partly because of the animosity. Uh, I think the, at the initial stage when the two men met and then subsequently cooperated, I think that was a moment that many Malaysians felt that perhaps they have put the past behind them. But I think in terms of the politics here and perhaps everywhere else, it's not just the two individuals, but also the people around them uh, that carry the agenda and uh, try to please their various political masters. And I think in this respect, you know, uh, perhaps uh, individuals like Dr. Mahathir and even uh, Mr. Anwar Ibrahim, you know, despite the issues they have had between them, have never really had any serious conflict in the last two years. But instead, I think uh, different actors from within the political groupings around them have been maneuvering uh, in order to uh, ensure that their masters, uh, you know, have the upper hand. And I think this is what has transpired, leading to the failed, uh, you know, attempt over the weekend, in the sense that some individuals have sought to uh, obtain allies from the opposition to try and ensure. Uh, a new government that excludes uh, Mr. Anwar. So I think that's what has transpired. And, and this certainly will uh, worsen the relationship between the two individuals moving forward. You, it will you, definitely damage the trust. OK, so you, so you don't think that, that this partnership between uh, Dr. Mahathir and Anwar Ibrahim will continue in the future? I think it will, partly because there is pragmatism on the part of both men. Uh, I think for Mr. Anwar Ibrahim, because he does not hold executive position in government, he does not have the levers over, over, over the national machinery. And so I think it's much harder for him to uh, influence the outcome. But uh, he is, you know, 25 years younger than uh, Dr. Mahathir. So perhaps he could wait a little while longer uh, and, and use this time to rebuild his party and support and prepare for the next election, which will, incidentally, only be coming in about two and a half to three years' time. So, so Ibrahim, he, he doesn't have enough support to now, at, at this particular moment, uh, to, to form a, a governing coalition on his own with, with him as Prime Minister? Yes, I think that's the, the situation, because uh, two other coalition parties from uh, his grouping has actually pledged support for Dr Mahathir yesterday. And, and so because of that... Uh, there is enough numbers for Mr. Anwar to call upon uh, to command majority in the parliament. So I think for now, uh, Dr. Mahathir has the upper hand. He has potentially the ability to gain majority support from members of parliament. Bridget, you, you talk about all this, this political manoeuvring, the, the, the political backstabbing that, that, that's been going on. Uh, it, and it's clear that, that some members of Mahathir's own coalition were working to, to undermine him over the last few uh, days, weeks, months. And yet now, now we've had the resignation and, and political chaos, many factions within the coalition have rushed to offer their support to Dr Mahathir. Why is that? What's going on? Well, they're politicians. Uh, their interests are money, uh, power. Uh, they want to be in a position of safety. 
um, political safety and future for their future. Um, when the power grab collapsed, we can now see that the, some of them are scrambling to get into a potential position of, of, a, of a new coalition or a new arrangement. Now, many of the parties have split, creating a lot more of the fragment, fragmentation in the system. And now, increasingly, some of those feel that, that they want to go for elections and joining a, and staying part of the opposition. Uh, this issue of who could do better in the elections is is underscoring some of the positioning they're taking in the in the infighting and the horse jockeying. So it's very it's very fragmented. Um, but so far, I want to emphasize that it's also been very peaceful. And and as has been mentioned earlier, is that the king has played a very important role of of, of engaging all the sides, uh, a sort of truth telling on different sets of positions, uh, and setting the uh, kind of a clear uh, constitutional framework in terms of how how the process is moving forward. So it's a very difficult transition, but it has been one that has been peaceful, and I think that is very important to emphasize. And so what sort of political realignment is mo most likely to, to emerge after all of this? Well, it's difficult to tell. I mean, uh, it's a, in the multi-party uh, parliamentary system that Malaysia uh, practices right now. Uh, each party has its own interests uh, collectively, but within uh, every party, there are individuals who are also... Uh, not necessarily in agreement uh, with another, uh, one another. So it's, it's, it's hard to tell at this point. Um, but um, uh, it is notable that they've been trying to uh, seemingly at least work things out. Um, and some party members already mentioned that they don't want to be in a coalition with another party. Uh, Amno, for example, doesn't want to be in a coalition with the, the, the BAP or the PAS, the um, Islamic Party, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, so to get a new coalition, uh, I, in my mind, it seems um, uh, more difficult uh, than what uh, some uh, say that it can happen. Ibrahim, what's, what's your take on, on that? How different to the Pakatan Harapan coalition will what comes next be? And, and will it be representative of all of the various ethnicities that make up Malaysian society? Well, in order for Pakatan Harapan to represent the broad cross-section of Malaysian society, uh, it needs to address the fundamental problem that plagued them in the first place, which is uh, the lack of broad-based Malay support. So I would imagine that if uh, he had this opportunity, uh, Dr. Mahathir could, you know, continue to keep most, if not all, of the existing uh, parties that had supported him, including his own party. Uh, but he could reach across the aisle and bring, you know, parties from, say, Sarawak, whom I think in the afternoon have already pledged support to him, but also uh, individual MPs from within AMNO itself, who uh, are of, you know, divergent interests from uh, the party leadership, uh, and, and because of that, uh, use it as an opportunity to solve several problems. Number one, gain the majority. Number two, uh, you know, get that cross-section of support that they desperately need. And number three, also use it to uh, expand his own party and establish, uh, you know, more power and control over the coalition moving forward. I think. Those would be some of the goals. I think the challenges, however, is counterbalanced by the need to select people to cross over. People from the old ruling party, from AMNO, may have a number of legal problems, you know, emanating from past irregularities. And I think uh, the biggest challenge for any new coalition is how do they convince the Malaysian public that this is a truly a government that's still committed to reform. Bridget, the, the Pakatan Harapan co coalition was, was fairly representative uh, of Malaysian society. How do uh, Chinese Malaysian and Indian Malaysians feel about, uh, I don't know, a, a, a more nationalist government coming uh, to, to be? Well, I think Ibrahim is correct that the that the the perception of the previous of uh, Pakatan Harapan was that it didn't have adequate support among the the majority community was among the Malays, but uh, that what the side of that was also that there was too much representation for, for being perceived by some parts of the Malay community of the non-Malays. 
And I think this is one of the big cleavages, is how, is, how are, is the coalition going to represent all of the different ethnic communities? And, and the leading party for the ethnic representation is the Democratic Action Party, as well as Anwar Ibrahim's party, PKR. And uh, these parties are the ones that are being um, thrown in terms of whether or not they're going to be in or not part of a coalition, especially the DAP. And I think this is part of the, uh, of the issue of how Malaysia is going to manage stability. Uh, uh, if you choose to leave out one section of group, then it opens up the country to uh, even increased identity politics and increased senses of issues of ethnic tensions, which have been which have percolated quite considerably in the last year and underscored some of the the under the tensions that have helped to the government collapse uh, as it did. Anto, uh, if there isn't a snap election, will any coalition government that emerges from this this chaos be strong enough to last? until the next election? Any coalition that is formed after this um, uh, political incident uh, needs to uh, assure, I think, the Malaysian public that they will carry on uh, the mandate of the Pakatat uh, Harapan uh, coalition um, that was formed before, uh, uh, which is to, you know, deal with issues of corruptions with the 1MDB, um, uh, and various other uh, issues that they want to uh, see uh, uh, brought, be brought to justice. Uh, if not, then it may all, probably not last that long and may be a short term again. And, and uh, in the end, uh, perhaps the snap elections will, will need to be held. So it needs to assure uh, uh, the Malaysian public that it will carry on what uh, Pakatan Harapan a coalition was voted in for. Yeah, Ibrahim, I, I think it's fairly safe to say that Malaysia's economy right now is underperforming. Um, what is all of this political chaos doing uh, for, for business sentiment in Malaysia right now and the economy? Well, I think the business situation in Malaysia has been impacted by politics for pretty much uh, most of the previous year. I think the lack of certainty over the transition of power from Dr Mahathir to Anwar Ibrahim, uh, you know, has actually colored uh, or influenced business decisions both inside and investors coming in from outside to spend inside the country, partly because of the nature of politics here, that as each individual becomes the prime minister, they will bring in their own team, they will replace many key individuals, and it might also mean changing some policies. So the lack of predictability does affect uh, economic performance. Uh, I think that's number one. Number two uh, is the issue of the Prime Minister's uh, age. So even if Dr. Mahathir gets reappointed as Prime Minister, the questions will again arise in terms of who will he have as his successor. And I think a key signal would be who he would appoint as a Deputy Prime Minister. I think the business community is going to look at that to see whether or not there's going to be continuity in policies or whether there's going to be further unpredictability down the road. Uh, uh, Bridget, we, I've got about a, a minute left of, on the programme here. Just, just summarise all of this for us, uh, if you would. Uh, uh, would it be fair to say that the more Anwar Ibrahim pushed for a date for a transition, the more forces opposed to his leadership have worked to find an alternative? Is that, is that a way we summarise what happens and what happens next? I think that happened to the power grab, but what we've seen since that is that we're seeing a new reconfiguration of a new coalition with other forces pushing for uh, elections. So we're going to see these two things be playing out um, and pushing for two different types of alternatives. Um, right now, it's a wait and see game to see if the different actors can form a new government. Thank you very much indeed for being with us, Bridget Welsh, Anto Mosin, and uh, Ibrahim Sufian. Uh, and thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see this programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion on the situation in Malaysia, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.